Okay, good morning, everybody. You're most welcome to the first panel one, I believe, Sensory Streets. Um, my name is Martin McCabe. I'm a member of staff here uh, in the TU. I work in the School of Media and uh, the Graduate School of Creative Arts and Media as well. And I'm just going to share this panel now. Uh, apologies to everyone. Uh, one of our contributors this morning, Simon Thompson, is unavailable and will not be making it. So uh, we have two. Conal Vaughan and uh, Emma Meehan presenting this morning. And we have a bit more time, obviously, we'll use it as best we can and wisely. So maybe we can be a little bit more relaxed about how we proceed. So I won't be screaming five minutes to anybody. Um, but uh, I'm not going to introduce these people in their biographical details. You can see that on the documentation that's already circulated. But uh, let me introduce, first of all, uh, Dr. Uh, Conal Vaughan, who's a colleague of mine, who's the program chair in the BA in Creative Arts and Visual Culture here in the TU. I also work with Connell uh, in uh, the Graduate School of Creative Arts as well. And uh, I'm going to let Connell uh, introduce uh, his paper this morning. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, thanks for uh, coming. Um, OK, so um, I'm a philosopher by training. And um, as Martin said, I work here in the School of Art and Design. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is um, kind of walking and its relationship to philosophy in general and um, uh, kind of public art that kind of appeared over the last two or three years in response to um pandemic. And um, OK, so you begin. Um, so talking the walk preamble. So. Um, I'll begin where most philosophy kind of begins, which is with this guy. So um, René Descartes, I think therefore I am, or Descartes to ergo sum, this argument is perhaps the most famous argument in the history of philosophy about the valorization of the individual and of the um, thinking subject as an independent uh, person. And for Descartes, this is a proof of existence. I think therefore I am. That's how you know your, um, uh, how, you, <laughs> how you know. And central to this uh, Cartesian position or Cartesian dualism, as it's called, is the relegation of the body um, to the role of a kind of vessel for the mind. And so today, well, four centuries later, philosophy is rightly skeptical of this approach. Um, but nonetheless, it's a kind of basic premise in lots of philosophy. Famously, someone replied to Descartes at the time, and as every um, Philosopher starting out will know at the end of Descartes' meditations, you get the replies. And one of those is from this gentleman, Pierre Gassendi. And Pierre Gassendi, 17th century contemporary, he has an objection that, well, any action could prove existence. No, anything could be your proof that you're you're alive or that you're, you know, that you exist. That's Gassendi's response. Descartes replies back to that. And he kind of dismissively says, this is the easiest one for me to defeat. And he says, I may not, for example, make the inference I am walking, therefore I exist, except insofar as I'm thinking of walking. So he brings it back to thinking. And it's probably worth noting that the example of walking is not Gassendi's, despite what we'll see. The example of walking is Descartes. So that hasn't kind of stopped the kind of contemporary presentation of Gassendi as some sort of kind of proto-pop phenomenologist, like, oh, he's defending the body. Um, and Gassendi's objection to Descartes was equally not saying, you know, oh, it's the body over the mind or anything like that. He was simply questioning why, why any action, walking or thinking and so on. Now, the primary culprit for today, I would suggest, for um, presenting Gassendi as saying, you know, oh, and bulo ergo sum, which is basically I walk, therefore I am. Notice he doesn't say that. He never actually uses those words. But the primary culprit is a Dutch artist by the name of Herman de Vries. Herman de Vries insists on lower cases in all contexts, in case you're wondering. Um, so his work, and bulo ergo sum, installed near a town called Vigne le Bain in France, which is near where Gassendi grew up, is a path up a steep mountainside. And what um, De Vries has done 
is he has marked the path with gold tip spikes and a stone on which are painted the words Ambula Ergoso. I walk, therefore I am. The romantic appeal of walking as an essential element of existence is central to this kind of acronistic uh, presentation of Gassendi as this kind of mystic philosopher of walking. He said no such thing. No doubt Descartes' lack of clarity and the confusion around well, what is philosophy and existence and so on is also a contributing factor. There is, however, some striking, uh, something kind of revealing here about walking and the appeal of walking. And I would suggest that the philosophically, the kind of the use of walking in arguments kind of has purchase here because of its complexity, its complex activity that exemplifies both the interconnection and inseparability of mind and body. It kind of is an act of thinking and not thinking in different disciplines. People would say that it's kind of the thing that actually, you know, explains kind of what makes us different to other species. Perhaps if even unconsciously, however, also every student of the history of philosophy knows that there is an intimate connection between moving and thinking, or as it's sometimes described, between wandering and wondering. Those things are related. And the stridency with which philosophers, from Aristotle to Rousseau and so on, insisted on incorporating walks into their daily routines is a standard pillar of most kind of, of the classic biographies of philosophers, that this is part of their method, this is how they walked. So Aristotle's, Aristotle, ancient Greek philosopher, his philosophy is even called uh, peripatetic, which is simply means walking. And so the peripatetics are the people who then follow literally walk behind Aristotle. And this comes from Aristotle's habit of walking around circumnavigating the Lyceum on foot as he philosophized. And so his, his texts are kind of notes that the students have taken down. This is important to kind of note because the shift from the practice of philosophy in the public space to its current usual indoor setting in a space like this, I have had philosophy classes in this room, um, is visible when we contrast kind of these ancient approaches to philosophy, for example, in the Platonic dialogues, such as the Republic, which begins with a walk to the Piraeus, which is the port of Athens, you know, and then kind of when we compare that to almost any contemporary practice. And the key writer on thinking about philosophy and walking and um, recently is Frederick Gross. And in his 2011 book, Philosophy of Walking, he connects the type of walking to the orientation of the philosophy that results. In other words, walking and philosophical method are regarded by his logic, by Gross's logic here, as necessarily attached. So the kind of walking you do will influence the philosophy that results. So philosophy is not only talking the talk, but talking the walk. So as you can see here, you see, I quote, the body's monotonous duty liberates thought. So it's kind of this thinking on thinking that allows for, um, as you can see there, thoughts can arise, surface or take shape through walking. Following Gross, we have here our philosopher, we can see someone like Friedrich Nietzsche's long solitary hiking, which is part of his method of trying to unlock ideas, as privileging a kind of aggressive meditation that results from exertion. So you see here that claim, probably as close as you'll get to Ambulo Ergo Sum, only thoughts that come by walking have any value. He says only thoughts that come by, only thought. in other translations, it's like only thoughts won by walking, you know. Um, so, you know, you can see at the end of this other one, it says here, you know, the thought itself, can they walk, can they dance? So it's a, again, you know, three, four hundred years after Descartes, you're getting that body being um, uh, privileged. Similarly, De Vries, the Dutch artist, in a very Nietzschean fashion, wanted the path that he had in the French hills to be difficult so that the body and the mind of the walker would register the effort required. And there I say that Nietzsche and not Gassendi was the philosopher that the artist should have referenced. In contrast, to Nietzschean philo uh, philosophy or Nietzschean walking even, the exact repetition of Immanuel Kant's daily constitutional, so consistent that the, the citizens of Konigsberg would apparently set their watches by his walking. He's sometimes referred to in many biographies as the Konigsberg clock. So this is to be regarded as reflective using Cross's logic as a kind of example of his precision, his rigor. 
And Gross almost has this thing that the walk wholly determines the philosophy. He said he kind of was like, I'm not saying it, but he is saying it at the same time, you know. So we get the kind of distinction between the um, the type of walking resulting and then the philosophy that results. Yet walking is neither a necessary nor sufficient condition for philosophy. And against Gross, contra Gross, walking like philosophy has a both a history and a politics. This is something that Gross denies. He says walking is walking. And there's just different types of it. But we know that walking has a politics, it has a history. And we can easily imagine those unable, less able, or even just less comfortable walking. And we can imagine those people philosophizing. We can imagine walking independent from philosophy. Rather, walking, I would argue, is really just the supreme metaphor for the body in motion. But it's that, it's the supreme metaphor. It's not the essence of the body in motion. As such, walking's continuity and improvisation seem to offer a kind of potential route for philosophical thought, but this need not be the only route. Okay, so that's the preamble. So the philosophy and politics of walking pace. And so this section I'm going to focus mainly on pace. We may be inclined to understand the politics of the street in terms of, and I'm sure in this conference we see lots of discussion about accessible space and place. But when we consider the activity of walking and philosophy together, we need also to recognize the role of pace. The hostile architecture of the city street is in part due to its enforcement of efficient and productive pace. So Susan Wendell describes expectations of pace as a common and overlooked form of entitled ableism. So you can see her, I particularly like her um, kind of throw a comment here on the brackets, you know, where could you rest for a few minutes in the supermarket if you needed to, you know, keep going, keep going, you know, that kind of pace. Um, and notice as well, well, she's not necessarily focused on walking, she does use it as an example as well here. One could walk here and see well. When Weldon points to the overlooked role of pace, she's both pointing to she's pointing both to the physical architecture of society and the hidden expectations of ability. In short, the street and its norms of walking with pace are disabling. So, and if you will ex excuse the kind of the rhyming, this was where I got kind of tri tripped up with the words, the pace of any space affects its sense of place. The challenge for designers, of course, is how to prioritise the pace of different walkers. And we see that, you know, just go on a forum about cycling and walking and whatever. We see this. The challenge for philosophy is to find a space that enables a productive walking pace, as we've seen. So where can you walk? And this is what, and you know, where can you walk at different paces and at a pace that will encourage critical reflection? So we know that philosophy takes time. It's not something that you can go, well, no, you just come up with this, you know, and there's a valoration of um, uh, old age and wisdom is associated with time. And we say wise beyond your years and so on. And so philosophy takes time and the increased speed of street walking then can be seen as incapacitating the ability of the street to function as a site of critical thought, reflection and even discussion. Again, same with the supermarket. Move through. You know that when you're in the supermarket and like they just keep rushing the thing and you've paid and you have to kind of, you know, quite quickly put everything in the bag. Um, accordingly, Wunderlich, a German philosopher, for example, contrasts what we could call purposive walking, which is walking with a purpose, as this kind of utilitarian method of transportation that normally invites this kind of constant rhythmical and rapid pace to a more discursive walking. And where you know the pace and the rhythm are synchronized to your own internal body rhythms. And we might see that these have become associated with all oh, that's urban walking versus kind of like countryside walking. And it's no coincidence then that the romantic escapist ideal of the countryside walk developed between the Renaissance and the advent of the Industrial Revolution, when urban walking sped up and walking pace quite simply became a sign of distinction. You know, your ability to walk slow and to parade, you know, even in Dame Street is named after it. Your ability to walk at slow pace is a sign of class. So Nietzsche would fit into this as well. This kind of escaping of the city. There's a kind of romanticism, even if it's very aggressive for him. Um, or another example would be Henry David Thoreau, 
and his championing of walking, for example, is precisely as this kind of method of self-discovery through finding your own pace. And we might say that such opportunities are routinely denied in the city street. Instead, street walking has either been conceived by philosophers in the last century as a form of active political resistance or an opportunity for coup detachment. And in the first um, uh, set of those, famously, you would have the work of Michel de Sorto. Um, and he identifies in walking a kind of a type of freedom from walking through urban spaces that would be possible, kind of resistance. So walking allows you for the sort of to carve your own path through prescribed urban space. And so it's this exemplary tactic to circumvent the kind of institutional strategies. Um, and so for the sort of walking is this kind of act of enunciation and I like to think of it for the sort of it's almost like you can jaywalk your way to freedom, but it's quite simply that it's the fact that you broke the rule, you know, you cut through. And while urban walking could be this side of liberation, it's always this kind of tension between kind of coerced compliance and your body is asked to kind of fit in a particular space. Um, curiously, the sort of is pretty silent on the role of pace, but we can imagine pace being included in such a kind of resistance walking but the sort of just doesn't mention it in any of his writings that I've been able to find. So you have this kind of resistance walking and the other type is this cool detachment and the figure of the flaneur as first theorized by Charles Baudelaire um, in the 19th century is kind of the prototypical sort of embodiment of this kind of passive um, kind of consumer as a kind of example of the modern experience of walking through the city. Um, and so here you get this kind of urban observation at a remove. You're enjoying the hustle of the city, but from the distance of spectatorship, you're kind of in the crowd, but not in the crowd and so on. Um, so that remove also includes pace. And so that's the kind of moment of this of kind of like class distinction. Everyone else is busy, but I have the time to be able to stand back or whatever. Um, and uh, the Flaneur is most extreme example um, as a practice and as a practice of walking, the Flaneur was expected um, to set their saunter um, to the pace of a pet tortoise. So that was like to be the ultimate Flaneur was to get a pet tortoise and use that to walk, say, through Paris. You know, I have time and so on. OK, so three, shut down streets, art and walking. The different pandemic public health restrictions on general mobility, artistic production and aesthetic reception experienced in most countries since early 2020, realigned, in the short term at least, but the boundary between the public and the private, between place and space, between indoor and outdoor. Adam Tuse convincingly argues that in most jurisdictions, the restrictions are better described as shutdowns as opposed to lockdowns or circuit breakers or whatever. Um, everyone still says lockdown, but shutdown is probably more appropriate as they were not entirely enforced from above. It's kind of hard to remember now, but like, you know, people have kind of shut themselves down for like, lots of those activities that happened. And so, you know, even though lockdown is a generally preferred time term, I'll follow Tuesday, because um, shutdown as a term accommodates the kind of fact that the act of street walking in the pandemic um, wasn't that you were necessarily locked into a space, but you were shut and things were shut. You could walk around. So in what remains of this paper, I will reflect on these restrictions in terms of both walking pace and its relationship to the art, some of the art developed on the streets. So I suppose, in essence, the kind of thing that I'm asking here is kind of what walking was possible in shutdown? What kind of philosophy was possible as a result? Because unlike the typical city walking, pandemic walking was uninstrumental walking. If we consider the inheritance of philosophy and walking as including this kind of regimented and targeted walker, we had Kant, or the romantic walker, Rousseau, Nietzsche, True. What are we to make then of this walker in shutdown? Um, when walking and on the street is less driven by productivity, perhaps it's easier to recognize that the pace of walking is not a measure of its virtue. The repacing of the street illustrates that slow walkers are not bad walkers. Some may choose, and perhaps you know, you're among them, they have chosen to use an app that counts your steps. That's not walking, that's counting. Um, and as Gross writes, walking is not a sport. So it's not to be competitive, it's a different act. 
the effect of the unclear, uncertain and unsettling realignment of what was permitted on the street also produced a, pronoun, a profound phenomenological uncertainty. And so in shutdown where the limit of movement was strictly defined, I recall where you know, your two kilometres was uh, policed, for example, um, closer to home, if you got into the Felix Park, they didn't, you could, that was a, you know, it was an extra liberation there. But, you know, a defiant walk as conceived by the Sarto began to take on this kind of different meaning, you know, or to break the rules. Well, actually what you're breaking, your know, public health rules instead of other kind of rules. And equally, the extractive pleasure of the flaneur among the crowd was less possible. You know, can't go and watch the hustle and bustle of the, of the street. What, what is there to see on the street even? So Heavy Carell, for example, has described the lockdown body, that's the language she uses, as experiencing this kind of phenomenology inscribed with anxiety and distance. Yet, I would argue, there was a certain liberation from the kind of prescribed productive pace of the street. And people's experience of the street and public art did not vanish. Rather, it was altered, bent, distorted, and I would say repaced. So I'm going to argue that the repacing of the street enabled certain public art examples, responses that engaged less instrumental walking and was productive of a deeper phenomenological, yes, and philosophical engagement with art where possible. So no longer could you simply ignore the statue when walking. It was this daily presence to be reckoned with, you know, because you were walking the same place again and again. There's like that repetition, the kind of Kantian repetition. Um, so its daily presence had to be reckoned with, both in terms of its content and its form. And this context of the pandemic only heightened reflection on public art's symbolic role. And was no doubt a contributing factor. I'm not going to argue it was the only factor, but it was a contributing factor in the significant iconoclastic reckoning with public monuments in a host of different countries throughout 2020. So this is kind of one famous example. OK, um, but there's examples in lots of countries. The public art created in response to the pandemic is further revealing in terms of pace. I mean, the shocking thing about this at the time was actually look at all those people on the street it was also another shocking thing at the time. It's hard to remember that. So this is an example I'm going to reference closer to home. In June 2021, the Irish street artist Asbestos painted this mural Pass Freely on O'Connell Street in Dublin. So the figure, a profile of the artist, is composed of nearly 5,000 individually painted burnt matchsticks, each representing a victim uh, of the pandemic in Ireland at the time. The work utilised the quote from Joseph Boyce, Pass Freely from one level of existence to another. Now I'm not going to get into the walking elements of that, but perhaps they're there as well. And so you can see that there on the title and at ground level. The mural was part of an initiative run by the nearby Dublin City Gallery, the Hugh Lane, which sought to kind of move its programme onto the street in the context of the pandemic. So then you, you think of walking pace in a museum and the museum out onto the street, the walking pace, um, you know, accordingly will be influenced. So now it's be at its best, this kind of piece presents a stirring gesture and captures the kind of scale of representation required in a public memorial of the pandemic, and this is only my kind of photograph at <laughs> a distance. Um, notably, for artists and beholders alike, the work centres on pacing oneself through the scale of the human tragedy of the pandemic. Here, each victim is commemorated as a burnt matchstick, not as an abstract number, not in any particular order either, um, any sequential order, we might say, and must be appreciated on its own terms. Further examples, related examples, I would say, artistically, um, of public art and kind of slash memorials that deploy a kind of listing aesthetic, um, but nonetheless crucially build on participation. Um, these are probably much more participatory than the previous example um, are here. So see these examples. In these examples, different objects are placed or markings are inscribed on a public space. In London, the work consists of a mural composed of over 150,000 red and pink hearts. In Dublin, thousands of palm white crosses adorn the red brick walls. In the church, in Sao Paulo, 38,000 pinwheels representing the dead of the city were attached to fences in a park in the city centre. So the location, the urban location of these is important as well. But thousands of hearts painted on walls square for um, the dead of the country in, in Brazil also accompanied this. So 
only have an image of half of it there. Now, the attractiveness of what I call this listing aesthetic is, I believe, obvious. Kind of in the anxious uncertainty of the pandemic, listing achieves two key aesthetic goals, making sense of the world and representation. A kind of egalitarian counting, even when anonymized, allows for some limited representation and inclusion. It also allows us to behold the sublime scale of the tragedy. Furthermore, it does so in a kind of harmonious and kind of uh, unified way. Although each entry in these examples is not numbered and there's no clear logic or placement such as chronology, there is a basic equation of one entry per victim throughout. That these works allow for and are in part created by personalized handcrafted labor and collect, uh, collective creativity lends them a kind of poignancy in the absence of public funeral traditions and rituals that were themselves restricted during the pandemic. And I would argue that there's a kind of pacing yourself through these works that's kind of asked for. Um, and asbestos, the artist here, for example, um, ritually repeated the boy's quote before every one of the, he painted every one of the nearly 5,000 matchsticks. So it's that kind of pacing that's happening that's required here, a kind of meditative pacing. So conclusion, walking at a downtown pace. Tellingly, parquet courts in their post-punk COVID era anthem imagine a return to a world not marked by a shutdown where you can, quote, return the smile of an unmasked friend, fighting temptation, walk at a downtown pace. Treasure the crowds that once made me so annoyed. There's the flinner coming back in again. So before we return kind of to these streets, I suppose the opportunity is to remember the pace of the street at shutdown. So the artworks here briefly described invite us to pace ourselves as we walk the street. In these memorials, the pace of the street is slow to the individual walker. This is a pace that is room for a certain philosophical contemplation. Even more than that, however, in shutdown, time, in shutdown times, outdoor walking offered the ultimate freedom from restrictions and it became almost the raison d'etre or we might say, it's the achievement of Ambulo Ergo Som in an urban context. The examples demonstrate the public art in the context of the, this pandemic and the restrictions it brings is a practice that drew on aesthetic pace not normally associated with the street. Other technological apparatus such as podcasts may achieve this effect, but not on a public scale. As these works fade, they take with them their enabling pace. Thank you. What I propose, because we don't have Emma after, that we get specific questions, if they arise from the floor to comment before we come together and do something orchestrated. So I'm just trying to get out to everybody in the room if they have a specific question based on the comments presentation. Yes. I'm particularly interested in, in walking and working as the public art coordinator in the new role my action deal or and and um, just in terms of inclusivity and thinking about like how you might even commission new work around the concept of walking mm -hmm. and the word, how you interpret it, and how you know you don't want to make it exclusive, but mm -hmm. also I have a friend who's in a wheelchair user and she says that she likes using the term walking when she's mm -hmm. you know using the wheelchair. So there's different ways of traveling and moving that we might use the word walking for. That might not be so restrictive to, to others. And I just wonder, have you talked about that with perhaps people with disabilities? Yeah, so I suppose that's why I was so reluctant at first to even use the term walking. I was trying to like unpick it kind of like, you know, it's about motion, really, and it's the body in motion and movement. And that like that that we can imagine different types of walking. And you know, um have I I, I haven't had kind of conversations about walking that so I'm more kind of get wrapped up as I briefly referenced about like cycling <laughs> and kind of moving is more my my experience. But um Wendell who describes, you know, like where can you sit down in the um in in the supermarket, Wendell um herself was in a wheelchair. And um so she was speaking kind of from that experience as well. And I'd say in disability studies there is a lot of literature on 
on that kind of building from Wendell as well um, about uh, um, you know accessibility, but it's really to think of it. I was just kind of trying to add in that idea of pace. You know, it's not simply like okay, well, the ramp makes it accessible, but it's like well, what are the other kind of um, social expectations around what pace should be? Um, yeah, I don't know. Is there more on? Yeah. Well, the, yeah, because the language of it itself, when it when walking is used as the example of like that's what the body does, mm. that that itself that language is very enabling and disabling, you know, and um, you know even when we think about like the the, the you know the it, as a metaphor you know think of what is it Lakoff and Johnson the metaphors we use determine uh, how we see things you know we think of like someone being able to stand on their own two feet and all this kind of um, thing so it's about the kind of the general infrastructure around yes yeah. To Arnold's class, a privilege which you mentioned yeah. in the 18th century, yeah, the introduction yeah. of the walk, that the seats in the Luxembourg Garden, for example, happened because of a certain class yeah, yeah. getting to know they want to rest on a walk and that notion of learning about the outdoors. But that thing of it is imagine it's some it is difficult to maybe imagine, but some people don't go on walks, they don't actually know how to go on a walk, yeah. and yet they're the very ones maybe who are needing to walk to bring their shopping home. So there's yeah, a yeah. contradiction between who goes walking. Yeah. And that's something that you could maybe add yeah. to maybe if they're thought on that. I think it's something that's quite fascinating um, in you. relation to how one, this is, you know, when you get in the other um, earlier session, there was the one about we're watching all the, the white people, privileged people going on their bikes, for example. Yeah. Um, then the walk also, like, who walks the field on Leary, for example, or, yeah. or who goes to Felix Park, or yeah. So the, you know. I mean, uh, the from what I can, um, what I was able to see in kind of the literature of class and walking, the origins of it as a, or the origins of it as a sign of distinction went back to the 16th century and specifically Venice, where it was to be seen to parade and walking. I imagine it went back a lot longer, but just a kind of contemporary. Got more modern versions of it are like um, as this site of class distinction and the elite being able to walk and how they could walk and not being touched and so on. Um, but um, I suppose another aspect of it that I would think about is, like, you know, for, for, to walk somewhere, you know, it needs to be kind of like inviting in a way. And if you think of like certain parts of the city are going to have like more tree cover than others, you know, and so they're going to be cooler, you know. Um, or certain parts of the city, like, you know, um, I would go on the walk, but like, I don't want to go down the steps of mine, you know, at a certain time and who can walk at a certain time. So it's about the kind of controlling of space. Um, but you had at the start, you asked a kind of question about like, who gets to, is it name walking, control walking? To, you yeah. know, to feel that they can walk as it were. When, when yeah. if they're asking about when people began to feel that they own walking too, besides yeah, privileged. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, I would associate it with, with time. It's a kind of leisure activity. And if you think yeah. as well, like like the, Nietzsche's example is like being able to like, I'm going to walk up a mountain, you know? But before the Romantics came along, people just looked at mountains as this, you know, obstacle in the way it's, it's just so annoying like why would you do that you know and like you know there is a period in swiss history where they're like why are british people coming here trying to walk up the mountains like what is that about you know but it's not british people it's like a certain class of british yeah man is like coming at this time you know and then it's like okay so it i i would definitely see that there's like that connection I was going to say, pick up on that point, the question of necessity versus yeah. yeah. related to questions. Yeah. So that is a yeah. privilege career that's been demarcated. It's funny, when you say walker to me, it always connotes Gore Tex and boots and nature and not the city. Although I'm a walker in cities, I don't go, mm. I don't go over grass and bog. 
But I was wondering about the distinction there between Descartes and Nietzsche. Nietzsche's escape, if you like, to nature. Yeah, well, yeah. That the Baudelairean modernity model that we mm. that's central to most of this thinking we have here is about this kind of phantasmagorical, kind of sensorial overload of the urban space. You know, Zimmo talks yeah, about, yeah. This, about the idea that walking, keeping your head down, or just going. Because with all these people coming toward you, you're not looking left or right, you're just trying to get through. And certainly people's habits and practices change because of the perambulations that they have to make, but also the bodies on the street. Sometimes like, I'm not going down that street. Go down Marlborough Street to get down the Carl Street. It's a quicker way to get through all of the people, some of who are disordered in their walks. I say that term in Dublin, you were the comics, <laughs> who are like all, you know, like they're tourists versus hawkers versus, you know, hang, people mm. hanging out, all the different kinds of walking mm. places. I am definitely, um, I have high demands of my walking, and I just want to get somewhere. I am not I'm doing my business. It's necessity, not pleasure. I, I suppose this is why I was kind of like, trying to be provocatively dismissive of saying like counting your steps is not walking. It's counting, and that's that's kind of that. that's kind of, <laughs> but that's that's it just it's like okay, it's it's like it technically is a type of walking, you know, if you want to think of it using your feet. But in terms of definitions of walking, it isn't really because it's a type of again that like utilitarian function. It's exercise. It's training for a certain thing. That's not why Nietzsche is going up the mountain either. He's not going up there to get fit. He's going up there to like have an aesthetic idea, you know. Um, uh, but so yeah, that's where I would say that it's you, you know it's like well if the if the walking pace of the street is all about like get there you know be there on time, it's not a space then of walking. Walking has um, as theorized by these philosophers is used as an example of being able to kind of like disassociate from um, you know the kind of normal expectations and be able to then freely think and the the repetition of the body. And of movement is supposed to be stimulating for new ideas. It's so yeah. I suppose it's it's like that. It's not a sporting activity in that case. I mean, I know there is a sport called walking in the Olympics, but again, try it. Yeah, but every time you look at it, you're like they're not walking. That's something else, <laughs> you know. Um, but I mean, okay, that's the name they use. But if you think about it again in terms of leisure activities, you know, you think about like classes associated with more pay, with with less pace, and having that time. You know, if you think of like cricket, which happens at this kind of walking pace, takes five days, you know, you know, certain people are get to be called gentlemen in the game, you know, it's kind of at that pace, whereas you think of much more rushed running, you know. Back to the topic. They're not, you know, pre-pandemic cities that we're living in at the moment. Or something else. I don't know. I mean, there's two, a few things about that. One is, I don't know if there is a future. It's a very criticized concept, um, particularly on gender terms. Um, uh, but so there's that. I think there's an element of it, it. It still has purchase and resonance because of the kind of alienation of modern cities, um, and also the the ability to kind of um, Photograph and document as a flaneur, and it kind of morphs in the 20th century into kind of like the digital flaneur. Then um, you think of other, I think of like situationist activities of drifting through the city and re kind of cutting up maps and then following them through the city. So I think those are elements that are still kind of probably have potential. But also, um, when when you say our cities, I think it depends on what cities. Um, I think maybe. In, and I don't know, but I would imagine that maybe in some kind of wealthier cities, maybe things haven't returned. But in other countries, perhaps, where most people in the city wouldn't have the opportunity of, say, working from home, I imagine some of those cities are probably um, indistinguishable from 2019. Um, but then in that context with the Flaneur, I don't know if they're necessarily associated with kind of Flaneur experiences. Thank you. Emma, if you want to come um, to the mic, can I introduce uh, Emma Meehan? 
who's a curatorial trainee currently in the National Gallery funded. Uh, so it's funded by the National Gallery, is it? That, that, that's a it's, funded... it's funded by Art Fund in okay, the Art National Fund. Gallery in London. OK, and uh, I think people can see the detail in your back in your in your bio here about you studied English Lit and the history of art and architecture from Trinity. So you'll know um, maybe Ellen Rowley from earlier this morning. And you also have an MSc in Modern and Contemporary Art Curation and Criticism from the University of, of Edinburgh. So if, if you want to go ahead there, and as I said, to Emma, we're, we're relaxed your time, and then we'll come back together and maybe sit over there. Amazing. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Emma. And just to say thanks to Connell as well, I'm really happy to see we've got a lot of parallels and even examples in common in our papers. So I'm sure we'll have loads to talk about later on. So today I'm wondering how can lessons from the pandemic contribute to sensory equity in Dublin's cultural spaces? So when the World Health Organization confirmed COVID-19 as a global pandemic in March 2020, many countries enforced drastic quarantine measures and lockdown restrictions. While the extent of these measures varied geographically, there were many similarities, such as the tremendous altering of the perception and physicality of global cityscapes. And as we now know, the immediate and long term consequences of the pandemic have been profound and extended well beyond the realm of public health. The sensory consequences of the pandemic have been similarly extensive. City life is fundamentally multisensory and cross modal. It consists of interactions which occur at multiple levels of sensory processing. One can often not perceive one sense without another, especially in the urban landscape. Probing into this transitory multisensorial cityscape can reveal how the pandemic highlighted and exacerbated extant social and sensory inequalities. The awareness of sensory accessibility as a value to strive towards in civic space has been growing and is reflected by the range of public art examples, which I'll discuss in this paper. And the term sensory equity will be proposed as a goal reflected by these examples. So sensory scholars have suggested a reordering of the senses due to the pandemic. As the sensory historian Mark Smith wrote in 2020, courtesy of COVID-19, we are undergoing a sensory revolution. So I'm concerned with this sensory revolution, revol <laughs> revolution and its consequences for accessibility in civic space and creative infrastructure. I'm going to talk about examples found both in Dublin and London, because I'm based there at the moment, since March 2020. And I'm going to discuss them in relation to their interaction with pandemic sensorium and this notion of sensory equity. This discussion affirms the claim within sensory studies that urban sensorium is an ever shifting social and historical construct. So first, I must describe the senses and elucidate this notion of sensory equity as a value to strive towards. So traditionally, five senses have been identified in Western philosophy and psychology. Um, these are the olfactory, smell, visual, sight, auditory, sound, gustatory, taste and tactile touch senses. Aristotle is credited with first theorizing sensory perception in the treatise on the soul, which was published around 350 BC. And since the 1980s, the popularity of sensory studies as a site of interdisciplinary exchange has exploded, mostly led by anthropology and history. Multiple journals of sensory research and pioneering organizations such as Art Beyond Sight, founded in New York, and Montreal's um, Concordia University Sensoria Research Team, it's a bit of a mouthful, have conducted, conducted exceptional cross-disciplinary research into human sensorium. In the humanities, a central revolution has invoked a reconsideration of the role and cultural formation of the senses across history. In his sensory history of the Renaissance, Francois uh, Quivigier writes, there is no sensation without the imagination of sensation. So as art historians and sensory scholars have demonstrated, popular theory on the senses has changed dramatically over time. For example, the Hebrews tended to prioritize the auditory, holding understanding as a kind of hearing, whereas the Greeks thought of it as a kind of seeing. Indeed, in Sense and Sensibilia, Aristotle identifies sight as the most important sense, as it carries with it the most information of the outside world. 
And in this way, sensory studies can reveal historical underpinnings of contemporary ways of sensing. So this exaltation of sight as a noble sense, the most important sense has persevered. It's been associated with knowledge, both spiritual and intellectual enlightenment. I'm sure many of you will have come across King Lear themes in many examples of popular media, um, making this association between sight and knowledge. And this privileging of sight, ocular centrism, has been increasingly challenged and counteracted by organisations such as Art Beyond Sight. It's not a universal sense, it cannot represent a universal city dwelling experience, and like most sensory or perceptual experiences, vision is more than an isolated sense, it is embodied and cross-modal. Cross-modal perception being the interaction between different sensory modalities. For example, high profile COVID symptoms reminded us of how much our taste is informed by smell and vice versa. Verging into this cross-modal understanding leads to difficulty in maintaining the traditional hierarchy of five senses. In our sensuous cultures, the role of artists has been to stretch the bounds of experience, using and combining the senses in ways which can radically re-embody prevailing notions of sensorium. As Alexander Arkhipenko put it, if you don't like garlic, you can't understand modern art. Shifting from a unisensory to multisensory perspective has been exemplified by recent scholarship and public art interventions post-pandemic. A recent example is the public project commissioned by DLR, Dublin uh, Dunleary and Rathdown Arts Offices and funded by Creative Ireland. In April 2022, DLR advertised their desire for a multi-sensory installation for people with dementia to be inspired by a painting by the local artist John Coyle entitled People's Park of the local park in Dunleary. In this open competition, candidates were asked to respond to this painting in multi-sensory ways rather than solely focus on the visual aesthetic. The commission was awarded to artist Joanna Hopkins, entitled The Growing Gallery, and I, yeah, hi. Uh, Sorry, it was my colleague who worked on it, but it's um, just over, just finished, but it's, it's, it's got great feedback. Yeah. Great participation. Yeah, it's amazing. So Hopkins assembled a community of participants, which included people with dementia, their carers and family members. Interactive sessions engaged with many tactile elements, so participants eco printed catmint flowers onto fabrics as well as propagating their own plants which were left to grow throughout the duration of the installation this project was funded by um, creative ireland's creativity and older age scheme 2022 which was specifically arranged to help mitigate the negative impact of social isolation brought on by social distancing and COVID. and the tactile and interactive elements of this project allowed for engagement on multiple sensorial levels. One participant noted how the visuals had reminded her of a poem, suggesting the role of the senses in memory making and the success and the success of this project in achieving meaningful multi-sensory interaction. So emerging from these observations is the notion of sensory equity. Sensory equity might be described as a commitment to incorporating multi-sensory experience into public art, so to include diverse groups of people. Sensory studies have been described as a way of loosening psychology's grip on the study of perception and providing an antidote to the logocentrism and ocular centrism of conventional historical and social scientific accounts of meaning. The Growing Gallery project exemplifies how multisensorial interaction can counteract the often ocular centric gallery experience, so to reach people with diverse access needs. In this case, the use of tactility and interaction to involve those with dementia, their families and their carers. In this way, the traditional public art experience in the gallery and the city, the ocular centric and requisitely ableist experience of moving oneself around and looking intensely can be re-examined re by sensorial public art. A recent publication, the Multisensory Museum, discusses the caregiving role of creative institutions in recognizing the museum experience as a multi-layered journey and the benefit in exploring multi-sensory curation in order to make objects accessible and meaningful to a wide variety of visitors. So in our current climate, 
meaningfulness and accessibility could be said to be found in acknowledging individual and collective losses which informed our pandemic social sensory relations. So, for example, the touch deprivation experienced by the masses, the interruption to memorialising and burial rituals, and the absence of so many, such as those who are immunocompromised from our public spaces. Moreover, social and sensory inequalities have been exacerbated exacerbated and environmentally induced during the pandemic. For example, COVID-19 cases and fatalities were highest in areas where quantities of nitrogen dioxide pollution, with its harsh accompanying odour, were the most concentrated. So, at the beginning of the pandemic, almost overnight, the experience of moving around the city was transformed. Infrastructure repurposed and public awareness of proximity to others inextricably heightened. During the height of lockdown, while most people were encouraged to stay at home, popular media was saturated with images of empty city streets and overflowing hospital wings, flocked with essential workers cloaked in personal protective equipment. Despite these, these sensorial and perceptual changes, what has been deemed the erosion of public space, the virus itself remains remarkably invisible, necessit necessitating strong public health messaging. Responses by visual artists, particularly street artists, to health messaging from official sources sources have been a notable force in pandemic civic spaces. So the now familiar image of the virus was first developed by two medical illustrators for the Center of Disease for Disease Control in Georgia. And these artists chose to emphasize the spikes with red coloring so as to highlight the molecules men menacing properties. And this graphic quickly became the pandemic's most iconic image, according to New York Times. At the beginning of the lockdown, the lockdown, the very beginning, Subset, a Dublin-based street art collective, responded to this already familiar virus image by representing it with a mural on Richmond Hill in Rathmines. So at the very beginning, we were already interested in making tangible and visible what was so intangible and only really visible through absence of people from streets or overflowing hospital wings. This, despite this multiplicity of pandemic visuals on our streets and screens, civic closeness had been challenged by the corporeal borders and restrictions necessitated by the pandemic. Street art responded to this sudden and specific sensory deprivation with familiar imagery. See, for instance, Lionel Stanhope's pandemic re rendition of Caravaggio's Supper at a Mouse, which was muralled onto a red brick wall in Lady Well in southeast London. While Londoners could not visit the Caravaggio painting, which normally hangs in their National Gallery in Trafalgar Square, usually free for all to visit, Local artist Stan Hope updated Christ for the pandemic age, giving him a pair of latex blue gloves. The weight of the messaging in this image is stark. The use of a famous locally significant image to describe current sensory relations and point towards the disruption of normal proceedings, such as eating supper together. Personal protective equipment became essential pandemic imagery in public health and political messaging. Social tactility and its deprivation was a key theme, as seen by the international abundance of murals depicting two people kissing with masks on. These images on the slide are striking not only in their reference to public health messaging related to touch and the deprivation of those tactile gestures, but also iconic images of public kisses in urban environments also referencing wartime imagery as well, which is interesting, such as the very famous BJ Day in Times Square photo printed in Life magazine, where a sailor, um, I believe, just kind of chose to kiss this nurse. Um, I don't know if she had any choice in it. And Dimitri Rubel's depiction of the socialist fraternalist, socialist fraternal embrace from the East Side Gallery in Berlin. What is consistent about these street art examples is one thing that's interesting is their international significance. The Pony Wave mural at the top is on Bennett's Beach in California, whilst the pre raphaelite kind of themed uh, mural on the far right is in Milan. Um, 
What is also significant is their referencing of social touch as a disrupted action, affecting behaviour and civic, civic closeness. As the pandemic progressed, public art projects incorporating civic closeness employ digital technologies to achieve accessibility or sensory equity in previously impossible ways. An intervention for Flannel's department store on Oxford Street in central London incorporated visuals designed by eBoy and a social message viewers to support those with muscular dystrophy by walking the last part of their commuting journey, donating their travel fare savings by texting a provided number. This installation works in cross-modal ways. Visualised in the centre is Carmela, a young girl with muscular dystrophy who had been self-shielding for five months. W1 Curate said, now we're getting Carmela out of the house and into a special 8K virtual London. This project reflects the digitalization of tactile experience during the pandemic and the influence of technologies such as virtual reality on public space. This installation digitally involves those who are absent from the city and engages the non-visual senses. For example, the experience of walking around London city instead of taking public transport, incorporates a key element of tactile perception, which is proprioception, the spatial relation of different parts of the body, extendable to the spatial relation between the body and its surrounding environment. Summer on the Square, the free public art festival hosted during August 2022 recently by the National Gallery included a number of interactive installations which were also cross-modal and reflective of the influence of digital technologies on our social sensory relations. One installation allowed for visitors to experience art through music, complementing four paintings from the collection with music spe specially created by orchestras of young people, while another installation allowed for visitors to walk through Van Gogh's wheat fields. The festival also includes a purpose-built art studio on the, fair, on the Trafalgar Square, which is free for all to enter. There's no booking needed, and it hosted a changing rose of public workshops, encouraging community and creativity after years of, of distance. The community workshop, which kicked off the festivities, which is um, the photographs here are from, Reflective Perspectives, explored the functionality of mirrors in self-portrait making, encouraging visitors to add their portrait to a growing community gallery, engaging the tactile and proprioceptive senses through a slotted sculpture construction, which required puzzle solving and communication between participants. Other examples of pandemic public art have engaged with the notion of sensory equity and civic closeness through tactility. A particularly tragic consequence of social distancing was the disruption to mourning and memorialising rituals. Measures to contain the virus barred families from tending to bedsides or holding funerals, disrupting touch, our only reciprocal sense during the time of grief. Studies have found that rates of traumatic bereavement excelled during the pandemic, disenfranchised grief becoming difficult to work through due to the restrictions on bereavement rituals. A highly effective and moving example of pandemic public art is the National Covid Memorial Wall on South Bank, directly facing the, facing the Houses of Parliament in London. This 500 metre long wall of red hearts added by those affected and bereaved by the virus was born out of collaboration between two groups, COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice and Led by Donkeys. Sharing a wall with St Thomas's Hospital, as of March 2022, more than 180,000 hearts have been drawn, the first on the 29th of March 2021. And the position of the wall, which has been called an elongated cenotaph, directly across from Parliament, and the possibly vandalistic action of drawing the heart on this unofficial memorial has sharp poignancy. This space acknowledges individual loss through the welcoming of tactile grief, allowing individuals to embody their anger and loss through creative and collective action, directly affecting the face of public space for creative and memorial purposes. The love hearts appear in multiple mediums along the wall. And uh, this one particularly affected me, the crocheted one there. Um, so this person, I can only assume crocheted at home and then brought that heart into central London to add to the wall. 
bringing the domestic action into the public space. And poetic verse inscribed on the wall laments interrupted memorial services, governmental negligence and hypocrisy. This unofficial memorial wall also adds tangibility to pandemic experiences, which can often seem intangible, acknowledging those who are missing from our public spaces and visualising and making tactile national and individual grief. There is also a digital wall of the National um, Memorial Wall, which was launched by Led by Donkeys. So it gives people online the option to virtually walk the wall, donate or to leave a dedication inviting testimony online as well. So tributes to lives lost to COVID-19 in Ireland have also engaged with similar sensorial themes. Pass Freely, a large mural by street artist Asbestos in collaboration with the Hugh Lane Gallery. Um, the figure in this mural is constructed of painted burnt, burnt matches as Connell has already described to us. The towering, um, yeah, so each match represents a life lost during to the virus and the towering figure is consumed by these matches. I can't help but notice that they're engulfing his form so that only his sight remains. And as we know throughout the making of this installation was the repetition of the artist Joseph Byers phrase, pass freely from one level of existence to another. So in this public memorial, asbestos combines text and image, sensory deprivation and communal loss to acknowledge those lives lost and our sensory adaptations to pandemic time. This work uh, is also part of a larger intention to move programming onto the street. Another Irish example combining tactile grief with memorial in public space is Lost Lace, a collaborative project by artist Miriam McConnell and poet Jessica Trainer. This project seek, seeks to engage the public to commemorate those we've lost to COVID-19. The first iteration was an installation for the Sculpture in Context exhibition at the Botanic Gardens in 2020, which is pictured here. And a larger installation is planned for the Ivy Gardens soon in October 2022. McConnell's practice often incorporates the lost traditional Irish art of lace making. For the upcoming installation, approximately 10,000 white roses, similar to the ones pictured here, have been made by the artist from individual white handkerchiefs. These handmade roses are in reference to cooties, which were small cloths traditionally hung on trees near the, sites, near the site of holy wells in pagan Ireland and believed to drive illness away. A Lost Lace Project website has also been created, inviting personal testimony of loss and, and pandemic sensory experience from members of the public. Four poems have also been commissioned for the project, which will be recited by the poet Jessica Trainer at the launch, where families of victims of COVID-19 have been invited to attend. Tending, oh, and this is a drawing um, for the upcoming installation, so it should look something like this. Tending to themes of tactile grief and memorialization in public space, Lost Lace shows how multi-sensory creativity can acknowledge both national and personal loss experienced during the pandemic. Accompanying the Ivy Gardens installation, it will be an exhibition of the artist's drawings for the project at the Olivier Cornet Gallery, which is near just off O'Connell Street, allowing for interaction with this project, both on the streets and inside the gallery space. Com by combining all of these modalities, the visual, the tactile, the auditory and the proprioceptive and even more, the contributors to this project have engaged with pandemic sensory equity and memorialization in particularly touching ways, in my opinion. So this paper aims to show how the sensorium of the city is in flux and recent projects have worked towards making a more equitable sensory experience in public space. Pandemic lessons have informed many of these projects and commissions. For instance, the interest in visualizing what is often invisible, encouraging interaction, civic closeness, 
public testimony and making the most of digital technologies can acknowledge sensory individual and national loss. The incorporation of tactile grieving into public spaces when and where it can be safe and the welcoming of personal testimony are also are key ways by which we can acknowledge pandemic sensorium and work towards more accessible public arts in the future. Thank you. And thank you very much. That was fascinating, Emma. And I was interested in how often you used the word interruption or rupture, uh, which of course picks up the way in which the pandemic itself was an interruption mm. to other lives. Um, but do you think the kind of public art which has generated, and particularly the, the, the sensory and transmodal um, examples that you showed, has placed an increased emphasis on interrupting what Colin was talking about, you know, the smooth passage of walking, for mm. example. It's deliberately stopping people or making them stop because they have to, to put the heart on the wall, for example. Do you think that's something that has been heightened in the kind of external cultural material you're talking about? The need for people to stop. Mm. Yeah, it's hard to say, but I must say there is a running theme in a lot of these and a lot of the research I've been doing on public arts and recent projects since the pandemic. And there seems to be a kind of running theme of people wanting to leave a mark on something, interaction in some way, be it visual, like drawing onto the project, just being involved in some way or another. And I think that's definitely related to the kind of deprivations that we experienced. I also think there's a flip side to that where the kind of, and this might be me kind of, um, uh, this might be conjecture, I'm not sure, but I feel as though there kind of is a little bit more hesitancy and some sometimes as well, but with, with us kind of during these community projects and workshops and getting really kind of stuck in and getting communicating with one another because there is obviously the disruption to normal life. So I've been running quite a few um, workshops on Trafalgar Square um, with the National Gallery and one thing that I have noticed is people love the idea of leaving a mark, leaving their a piece of themselves behind for others to see. But on the flip side of that is that there's increased kind of hesitancy of getting stuck in and involved with community projects. So it's kind of, yeah. Hi. Thank hey. You very much. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, the way during the pandemic as well, people were localized. We had our uh, two kilometer limit. But in some ways, did we take ownership of that bit of the urban landscape and, are, and therefore are more encouraged to become part of more public projects? Yeah, I think absolutely. And that's a really crucial point as well. Um, I don't know about you guys, but just from personal experience, I know that my local area um the the local strands and everything was just so so busy during the pandemic and only recently i've had conversations with people saying oh isn't it great how much more of an interest in local pride there is now so i think that's absolutely a key feature as well and i think that there's that desire as well to kind of beautify your local area and make it relevant to your life um so I think, yeah, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, I think even that like, people have taken over ownership of pathways outside mm. their house or alleyways, you know, at the side of their houses or whole neighbourhoods taking over kind of alleyways, which is quite interesting. I just think, yeah, there could be a relationship between then feeling more, um, I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for, uh, not just receptive, but maybe more likely to engage in that kind of work. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've, yeah, I'm going to think about that for sure. Like the idea of people kind of sprawling out of their domestic spaces to make a real proper tangible mark on their local area. I've definitely noticed that. Um, so yeah, thank you. I have a question about. Yeah, please, no, go ahead. Yeah. Um, just also in relation to art becoming a space to in public to process and really mm. interested in that aspect, aspect of the presentation. And um, I think it's a very empowering way to engage the public and also artists engaging in a creative way, but or creating images in public space. But I think that 
break into the post pandemic, just that that uh, trajectory we drew around bereavement and the <clears throat> increased trauma because of the invisibility of the mm. virus and the lack of contact that we've had even uh, through touch. And so I just found the presentation fantastic. Oh, thank and you very much. As well. Thank you. We start to heal and cope with our day life and so they make those connections. Yeah, the, the the idea of kind of the tactility of grief was really kind of my anchoring point in this paper and that idea of kind of affecting civic space in a way that's personal to you. And I think that Lost Lace, for instance, is just the perfect example to illustrate that as well as the National COVID Memorial Wall and those um, the, the cross project, which um, was on your presentation as well. Um, I think it's really powerful and it's just as some a point that I never really got the chance to make as well as the proprioceptive of the experience of walking around the city it's really heightened when you can see and hear and I, I, you can't smell grief but maybe you can sometimes <laughs> but it really is a multi-sensory experience going along these um, memorials and they're really really touching as well and I think that that's a really beautiful part of it as well the idea that walking with the city you can walk with that experience that we all had together thank you Anna. thanks oh one more question yeah, sorry just yet yeah, because I'm yeah, go. oh yeah in relation to the handmade nature hmm. of a lot of memorials, it's very interesting um, because they, in many ways, I don't know if you would have, what, what, what you would think about that in relation to a lot of them have come from the ground up, if they come from the person, rather than a lot of memorials, say, to do with doors and um, bigger state loss, might we say, or yeah. that, that, that of the population um, from, a, from a higher end. Maybe with it to stow the other elements. It's easier to open the nails than you're talking about the hand cut process and the crochet thing you talked about. It's quite interesting. It's almost also quite feminine. Mm, yes. Whether it's done by different identities, but the, the, the actual manifestation of it seems to be quite feminine. And it's yeah. very interesting. I don't know, would that be an observation that you would have noticed? Or maybe as you were working with Asher Gary, like when you were thinking, showing about um, even the mirror is actually a domestic thing. Yes, actually, yes. Which is on step four, right? Uh, the handmade of the paper. I think. Mm. You might, uh, that's so. Like that. That's so fascinating. I love all the points you've made there, especially like the craftiness of all of these materials, which became part of the memorials. I've thought about it a lot, but I haven't really come to like a tidy conclusion of what it might mean. Yes, but it is very interesting that often, for national losses, figures are used to represent that and it's the figure in history that we assign a name to them and a lifespan and maybe a battle or two and we can learn it like that and it's fairly simple but it does seem to be a running theme with covid memorials that it's more abstracted forms more domestic forms that are used and i suppose that connection might be the kind of intangibility the invisibility of our experiences but definitely need to think about that one more thanks there's practicalities of artists in lockdown going, oh, I have no materials. What can I That's like, true as well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll take a seat now. Yeah, because we'll go we'll over stretch this now because I think there's possibilities of us having a little bit more of a conversation with uh with Colin as well back in the week. And maybe there's other stuff coming out. Actually, apropos the smell of grief. The RTE radio journalist this morning at about half past seven said. She was overcome with the smell of flowers around Buckingham Palace this morning. Oh, very good. I don't know if that's going to work for anybody, but that's <laughs> what I heard. Um, but uh, I'm curious because um, the question of sensory equity kind of speaks to me as something as well, because I'm, I'm thinking about my suggestion when I was talking to Colin earlier about at least pre pandemic when the streets are thronged, you know, I mean, part of the excitement of being in urban space very often <clears> is the overload, you know, like neon, for instance, we don't see, I'm thinking of the e-boy piece that we've shown, yeah. which, which some people might consider to be a full, because I'm, I'm assuming it comes on after sun, 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 um, what do you call it when the sun does there? Okay. Yeah. 
sunsets. Yeah. Sunsets. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm assuming when the lights are uh, low, this becomes into its own. So it's something that runs overnight. Am I, am I right? So it was only on for a brief amount of time. But the graphics were there, I believe, throughout the day. But then it was only kind of came to its full effect yeah. after. The shop was not doing business then, am I right? No, they do business. That's and it's kind of a rolling um, program. And um, questions from the floor then, I, if in some way that we can move these together, because it seems to me that uh, Carl's interest in time specifically, I'm thinking as a resource or material that is then complemented by Emma's focus, I feel like on maybe on taxidermy or a lot of the works in both of our papers, they have the kind of temporary nature to them, you know, you were saying about the work to be like, you know, you think of a public memorial and it's just like this. But these works are overwhelmingly temporary ones and like street art is supposed to be kind of temporary, you know, it's good, someone else paints some other street art over it. Um, but so I think that part of that is, it, you know, you mentioned touch a lot, people being able to touch the works and they're not meant to last in a way, and I think that it's interesting. You don't usually think about purpose of art being to process grief, you know, some people do, but um, you know, there's something else happening. It seems like they're there. We want to use this to be able to forget, to overcome, and there's a kind of you know, deliberate forgetting that we want to do when we to use this kind of target to kind of practice. I see that in a lot of the works, and that's why, like, oh, they're touching and they'll fall away. And, they can be painted over and then another the politics about the memorial wall in London about how it's going to be preserved and you can digitally watch it online but like those crosses are down pinwheels in Brazil are down um I mean the dereliction of a Street means that the asbestos species are still there um but <laughs> the, be there in yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the, I can go home about you know but um you know the same way that like you think of the previous pandemic you know that's not really in the consciousness, and it wasn't really for a long time. I mean, exception between the, 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 the flu. Spanish flu. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Like it, you know, it's like it, it doesn't register. And like I, I can't think of any about that really. Yeah. There was a few bits of poetry or sure, and, but can't think of any visual art to associate with that. And I think sure. that these works have kind of got that as well. It's like, yeah, they're here for a while and they'll be lost. I think the asbestos example is significantly different in that you can't touch it. Yes. You know, you can like, oh, the, the Joseph Boy's quote is on the board and like, fine, that's there. You can like touch that or paint over whatever, but like, no, it's in behind the wall. It's up there. You see it at an angle. And I think that's the difference between it being kind of more officially sanctioned. The, the museum has got a kind of like, okay, you can touch the label, but you can't touch the, the painting. Whereas the more, Kind of organic works from the kind of bottom up. Yeah. You might want to say those ones are all touchable. Those ones are all you can interact with and paint over in the few. The hearts are still, still on. They are right. Yeah. yeah. And they are painted with material that will eventually fall. Most of them are painted with poscas. So with the rain and winter, I don't know how it's going to last. But there's a lot of precarity about whether it's going to remain, and there's also a lot of People would really like it to remain in the UK from what I've kind of heard and learned, especially in London. I think people find it really nice. And I think as well, there's that added kind of symbolism of the sea of red right opposite the House of Parliament. Londoners are, I think, quite fond of that symbolism, which, you know, you can draw so many meanings from, especially with everything that's kind of happened with with the pandemic, but it will be really interesting to see what happens with the memorial wall, for sure. I think it comes to that point as well about memories and testament to, because uh, it struck me that, as we know, street art is contemporary, but also gendered, the debates that happened in the 70s around monuments, and, you know, the state speaks in this, as you say, this mono monologue, mm -hmm. that these pieces are granular, they're granular, they're low, they're from the bottom up, they're using uh, materials. They, the, the lace piece is ceramic, am I right? No, it's... Those, it's those, the objects that we see on the lawn, they're roses, but how are they made? What are they made of? They're made of 
faults of koozies. Um, oh, so the, okay, it, they are very tempting. Yeah, yeah, and it will be this um, the effect, I assume, will be something almost like a doily. So yes. I say, um, Soft on your foot, then, I suppose, if yeah. you were to tread on Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's interesting that it speaks to uh, Christian Bolotansky, the artist who yeah. has worked with, work with fabric as well, actually. Well, he said that if you put a memorial, well, then, if you put a memorial, like we're used to, the kind of war memorials or whatever, in a public space, that after a certain length of time, you don't see them anymore. They don't need upkeep, they don't need anything, they're just that this look after yourself. Whereas if you have a memorial that you have to care for, then you'll remember that what it's, what it's remembering much more so, because you have to turn to it like a garden. Yeah, yeah. interesting. I don't I it would be I don't know if we're going to see somebody going around with a red Posca like refilling <laughs> the hearts on the wall because it's such a personal <laughs> moment as well. I'm sure it would kind of feel like overstepping if somebody was going to almost conserve conserve the the memorial wall. Yeah, I think yeah. there is a gone through to that word that maybe the word but not actually yeah. Wash them with it, but the way it's actually tied in with the plant each other is not being got speaking to degree in a particular way. But it is interesting, I've heard or seen even community petitioning to their you know to their councils to keep some of the temporary mural signs mm -hmm. that for example have created and sort of their commission was temporary work, but then it might get damaged or start to deteriorate and you know they're asking those artists to come back sometimes and it, it throws up lots of uh, questions around it as well. Also, when an artist is commissioned, when the contract is finished, you know, they move on, they're not going to come back to be redoing those temporary works. But I think there's an aspect where local communities or, or neighborhoods who are living in areas, they get used to it and they sort of take ownership of it and are sad. They create the loss then when that temporary work is gone. Mm -hmm. um, so that all comes into the, the idea that the thinking around commissioning and, and what the public's expectations are of yeah. temporary works that they also get attached to every document. But, uh, I just add about time because of what comes yeah. with everything and even earlier with them, the two downstairs, our, our relationship with time is very strange. You know, I mean, we're talking about, you know, what we don't think, but actually COVID still forever like my relationship in world terms. And I mean the world is a very small place now because um uh, the way we communicate with the world. But so what we will do or how we're celebrating or marking or celebrating, we're still in it in a sense. And I think in four or five or indeed ten years it might be interesting. At least if you're talking about the painting, but I think this will be on a false note to you. <laughs> you know, in a fascinating way, I'm reminded to take in the movement of and then we moved on by it. Be conscious, yeah, <laughs> but be conscious of holding the time which I'm walking in So the same way in relation to marking what we're doing with COVID, we haven't probably maybe started to process it. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time that we might forget a lot of it because it's part of process. And like these preparatory drawings, um, they remind me, and I can't think of the name, who's all of people around the building? Um, the Christo. So it has a look of that about it, you know, and again, those preparatory drawings that all the Christos, you know, some of them, that's actually often what remains rather than the thing that will happen there. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think that's amazing. So we're likely enough to see this work in situ in the next month or so. Definitely we'll see this work in the Ivy Gardens. Um, I think off the top of my head, um, it's the last third week in October, I'm pretty sure, or the last two, the second half of October, but it should be really great. And I also looked at, there's a number of preparatory drawings which are going to be exhibited in the Olivier Cornet Gallery, it's just on Great Denmark Street. And it's really small, nice space. And um, yeah, I, I think I'll be back in London before so I won't maybe get to see it installed. But uh, yeah. We should look out for it then. Yes, definitely. It should be really nice. Okay. If we don't have any more work, I think we'll probably get on time, get back for our one o'clock. Yeah, we yeah. have. Uh, our, the tour is at 10 past one, so we oh, have okay. some breathing yeah. space yeah. If, you, if you want to hang on. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I'm, I'm not keen to overextend it. I mean, I think there's lots of things popping up here that hopefully, yeah, we have more questions, but I was going to say, this stuff that will carry on to another session or again, when people are having convening downstairs for the key. It's great to have that really yeah. great to bank on to well, just if you see, like just in that whole context, you have that slide of the statue coming down, yeah, which yeah. I think is a great parallel. Yeah, I think like, well, part of what I think of that, obviously, that's part of the global kind of movement, you know, as well. And you think of like public art, and particularly street art, like street art doesn't exist just for its locality. And it hasn't done so for the last maybe 50 to 60 years, because, you know, um, it, artists just photograph their work and now they put it online. But like even when the street art in graffiti starts to develop in the US um, after the war, it was like the exchange of photographs between the East Coast and West Coast. It was always they were putting it up to show other people. It wasn't really simply just about like care for the locality. So when I think of the coast and statue being, you know, removed, um, I think it's part of that kind of global thing. Like people just have in a sense the time to do that. But like, hey, let's go do it now. It's time to kind of do that. But also it's like, oh, that statue there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we can do things. Things kind of became in a sense possible. You know, um, in the, certainly in 2020, we can do these things now. Um, I don't know that that's the only kind of thing, but it was just kind of building for it. Um, so the the. I'm doing some work with Bristol at the moment as well as part of the kind of traineeship that I'm doing. So I actually have been doing a lot of research into kind of um, maritime identity in Bristol and the legacies of the slave trade. So with the Colston statue, one thing that I think is quite interesting is that movements to get that removed have been going since the 70s, even earlier. Um, quite high profile. I think a um, massive attack, the band actually cancelled their show in 97 or 8 or something because the Colston's Hall was still, it was regularly tagged a Hall of Slave Trader like for decades before and the city council had regularly kind of just swept those requests to the side. So I think with that moment in time, it was also kind of it's a global movement, but it's also that very, very like Bristolian identity and that time of lockdown to say, maybe to have the space to think, oh, we let's do something with this. And I, from what I've heard from colleagues who work at Bristol and who were there um, on the day that it felt very spontaneous, it felt like it wasn't planned and that it was just the natural kind of impulse that the crowd just surged and, and did it and then it was done and it happened and then it was kind of like a sigh of relief afterwards once he was in the harbour. So I'm not sure but I do think that it's kind of that the pandemic, that lockdown and all of the things that were happening just with the Me Too movement just having passed with Black Lives Matter, the murder of George Floyd and everything like that. It was just kind of like a a, a storm which led to this happening. There was one thing I was going to say about um, Colston, which I've now lost in. Uh, yes, one thing is that I think that's a really good kind of um, example of what people want from public space and how they're going to get it. Mm -hmm. Because after Colston came down, that spontaneous removal, the artist Mark Quinn, I believe, yeah. plopped a, yeah. do you remember this, plopped a, a protester onto the pedestal with no, yeah. nobody from Bristol asked him or gave him the permission to do that and then it was quickly taken away again. And since there's been quite a few reports of what are we going to do with this pedestal because should it be left empty, what should be, what should happen with it? And um, from what I've read, the majority of people seem to say, I don't know. And that's like such a fair answer. <laughs> okay. uh, just before we finish up, just to remind you, there's a tour of historic buildings meeting in the foyer at 10 past one. It's a short tour to give you time to find your lunch and uh, head on down to the lab for half two, depending on, on what it is you're, you're uh, engaging with this afternoon. Good. Otherwise, we'll see you back here in the morning. Yeah, thank you, Nidana. Thank, thank you, Emma. Thank you, Tom.